welcome to everyone this morning. Thanks very much for joining us. My name is Michael Chase. I am a researcher at the National Center of Scientific Research in Paris, the Centre Jean Pépin, and I am also a uh, an invited scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. So this uh, is going to be the third series of our this third session rather of our series scientific questions then and now and now this series is a joint project of two research groups at the max planck institute for the history of science in berlin um, one of them is experience in the pre-modern sciences of soul and body directed by katja krause and the other is the historical epistemology of the final theory program directed by alexander Blum. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody who has worked so hard behind the scenes to make this series possible. First and foremost, uh, Anina Voschnig, who has been responsible for all digital aspects of this series and many of the administrative ones as well. Thanks as well to Alex Bloom's research group assistant, Ksenia Mohelski, and to Katya's student assistant, uh, Emily Filippi. Now, uh, as I said, this is the third session, and after an initial session that featured a discussion of Carlo Rovelli's views about the uh, relevance of Aristotle to contemporary science, we then had a session last March on creation. And today uh, we are, and tomorrow, we're moving on to two sessions on space and time, respectively. Now, the format of this series is probably familiar to most of you by now. Uh, for each of the chosen topics for this year, which is focused on physics, we've chosen uh, a certain number of themes, creation, time, space, and matter. And then we've invited experts from two very different disciplines. On the one hand, contemporary scientists and historians of science, and on the other, experts in the history of pre in the history of pre-modern science and philosophy. Now we've asked each of them to give a brief account of the topic, in this case, time, from the special perspective of their discipline. Our goal is to see whether ancient and modern views on the chosen topic are in fact so different as to be incommensurable, in which case our guests will presumably have nothing to say to each other, or, and this is of course the outcome that we're hoping for, whether there may prove to be points of consonance and kinship between ancients and moderns, perhaps emerging from points that we had not even foreseen. This is what we've, has been our experience so far. In short, our goal is to encourage dialogue between these two very different dis dis disciplines and two very different historical periods. And in the ideal limit case, we want to contribute in some modest measure to bridging the gap between the sciences and the humanities, which we feel has been and is increasingly being extremely deleterious to science, philosophy, and intellectual life in general. Today, we're delighted to have five very eminent scholars to speak with us on various aspects of the question of time. We have with us Jose Baracat of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sur. We have Pandaris Golitsis of the Einstein Center Kronoi in Berlin and of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. We have Sajad Rizvi of the University of Exeter. We have Julian Barber, an independent scholar from Great Britain. And we have uh, Karim Tebo of the University of Bristol. And I thank all of them for generously agreeing to participate in our series. The format for today will be as follows. Each presentation will be about 20 to 25 minutes long and will be followed by about 15 minutes of discussion. We'll first hear from professors Barber, Barakat and Golitsis in that order. And then we'll have a brief coffee break after which we'll resume with the presentations of professors Thebo and Rizvi. Then we'll have a 45 minute break for dinner and we'll conclude after that around 7.15 Berlin time with a general discussion, which should last about 45 minutes, Berlin time. Now, I'm very much looking forward to this session. I've always been intrigued by what seems to me to be uh, a deep-seated division in contemporary science. Generally speaking, and with lots of exceptions, 
since most of the basic equations in physics are symmetrical under time reversal, many physicists believe that time is somehow not fundamentally real and may even be illusory. This was the case for Einstein, apparently, and uh, Professor Barber has expressed views along those lines as well. Now, uh, this, that's for physics, of course. Now, when we come to chemists and biologists, in contrast, they tend to emphasize the very real and important nature of time. Now, ancient thought also presents a variety of uh, diverse views on this subject. Plato, who might be said to be more inclined towards physics than to biology, um, demotes time to the status of a mere shadow or image of eternity, whereas the more biologically oriented Aristotle uh, also grants time an ambiguous ontological statue, statue. It's He writes that it is somehow connected with motion and change, but does it have an independent existence apart from motion and change? Nobody really knows. Later Neoplatonist theories, as we'll see today, offer elaborations on these notions of time, going so far as to distinguish different levels of time, up to three or four in some cases each endowed with different degrees of reality. And in a seldom studied development, this multi-level theory of time reappears in later Islamic thought, especially in Iran. Whether independently of Neoplatonism or not, I don't think anybody knows so far. And I hope that maybe Sajjad Rizvi, who's a great expert on this theme, may have a few words to say about that. Anyway, so much for the introduction. Uh, now I'm going to move on to... Uh, have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Julian Barber. Dr. Barber uh, is, has had a uh, rather unusual career in the sense that he has not been uh, throughout his career affiliated with an academic institution. He's been what the Germans call a Freie Wissenschaftler, Wissenschaftler and what we inadequately translate as an independent scholar. But of course, he has had multiple uh, collaborations with some of the most eminent scholars in the world as well. He has, he received his PhD in 1968, and since then he has published uh, several major books, The Discovery of Dynamics, which investigates the background to Newton's discoveries, The End of Time, uh, which is, is perhaps his most famous book, in which, as the title implies, he suggests that perhaps time is not fundamentally real. And most recently, uh, this wonderful book, the, the Janus Point, which turned out in a couple of years. This is a, a absolutely fascinating book. Um, it's quite dense in parts, uh, quite technical. But uh, I want to point out, perhaps this is a spoiler alert here, the last chapter of the book I found especially beautiful, because there, uh, Dr. Barber reflects on the totality of his long career and writes to uh, writes, for instance, uh, near the end of the book, that besides its purely scientific aspiration to understand the origin of structure in the universe, this book seems to have become, at least in part, a song of thanks to the cosmos and to the fact that I, like you, am a participant in whatever it does. So I think that these ideas are important today when uh, a lot of scientists and pop vulgarizers of science write that the world is entirely meaningless uh, and that we're and hostile. And Professor Barber is reacting against this view uh, in this wonderful work of his. And I think that that's a very important and brave attitude to take on. So without further ado, uh, uh, and with renewed thanks to all participants, I pass the word to Julian Barber, Professor Barber. So um, this is me at the, the, my home in North Oxfordshire, College Farm. Uh, you may know that uh, for over 20 years, I've been promoting something which I call shape dynamics and the Latin tag underneath. College Farm is because I bought it from New College in Oxford. Uh, and the Latin tag means beautiful shape. So perhaps we can go straight on to the next slide, please. Well, that's just some background reading. Uh, 
really at least two of those books have already been uh, mentioned by Michael. Um, if you want something short about clocks, that's the first one, The Nature of Time. The, it's on an archive, you can find it there. And for somebody who really wants to get into shape dynamics seriously, there's a, a splendid book by my collaborator, Flavio Mercati. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Now, Isaac Newton uh, published his famous Principia in 1687. And in it, he said, absolute true and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without relation to anything external. And by another name is called duration. And I guess maybe that's what people before Newton felt and thought, but certainly that definition of Newton really fixed the notion of time for many, many scientists. Um, but I think ultimately it's completely untenable. Uh, closely related to that, he said that absolute space in its own nature without relation to anything external always remains similar and immovable. So basically you can think of absolute space in Newton's mind as something like a great block of translucent ice on which you can sort of draw straight lines that go along at a certain speed because you've got time to, to measure things. Now, that's just not how things happen in the real world or what real scientists do. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Um, so there was a strong reaction to that by Ernst Mach, after whom the Mach numbers uh, get their name who wrote a, a famous book published in 1883, in which he said, it is utterly beyond our power to measure the changes of things by time. Quite the contrary, time is an abstraction at which we arrive by means of the changes of things. So I, I look at my, my clock here and see that the hour or the minute hand has moved forward a certain time. It's the motion of the minute hand forward that tells me that a certain amount of time has passed. Uh, and he also said that the universe is given once only with its relative motions alone determinable. If you have a completely featureless block of ice, uh, you can't see where anybody is on that thing because there's no markers on it. But you can see if there are skaters on a pond, you can see that they get closer to each other or further apart. Um, and uh, Mach's comments were very, very influential for Einstein's creation of general relativity. I think one can say if it hadn't been for Mach's critique of Newton's comments, we wouldn't have general relativity. So let's go on to the next slide, please. So astronomical practice supports Mach. Uh, Hipparchus in about 150 BC, uh, it was well known already to Aristotle that if you take the rotation of the earth as we now call it, but they thought of it as the rotation of the fixed stars, the bowl of the sky. If you take sidereal time, which is what the stars tell as the clock, then the sun does not move uniformly around the ecliptic. And so there was two motions. Do you take the motion of the sun around the ecliptic to, to measure time? It differs by four minutes a day on average from the uh, rotation of the earth, but there's, there's non-uniformity on top of that. And Hipparchus developed a theory to explain how, how that could be. He assumed, and this was the great thing that the Greeks did, was to imagine that the strange motions on the sky, on the two-dimensional sky, really reflected beautiful uniform motion in three-dimensional space. And Hipparchus assumed that the sun moves on a perfect circle, perfectly uniformly, but the center of the circle on which it moves is displaced from the center of the earth. And with that simple model, he uh, obtained a wonderfully accurate theory of the sun's motion. Now, uh, 300 years further on, Ptolemy, uh, 
drawing heavily on Hipparchus's idea, had developed a theory of the moon. And it was quite accurate, really, in, in, in saying when the moon would be full, and in particular, when there would be eclipses of the moon. Um, and what he noticed was because the sun, because the moon moved very fast, his theory only worked if he used the time, sidereal time, uh, and not that of the sun. So there was already a clear indication for Ptolemy that it's really the motion of the stars as seen from the earth, or now we would say the rotation of the earth, that determines a more fundamental time in the sense that then you got a simple theory of the moon's motion and you could predict what would happen. And so he declared that sidereal time does is what we should use. And that really stuck until the, I think was eight, uh, the 1950s, I think. So Ptolemy was, was a very big influence in that respect. So let's jump forward to Copernicus. Now, Copernicus's great achievement, by the way, Copernicus shouldn't be said to have created a heliocentric uh, model of the solar system. His theory, and he really emphasizes that, is a theory of the terrestrial motion. What he did was show how you could explain the extraordinary retrograde motions of the planet. So let me just talk a little bit. So to the left of Copernicus's portrait, you see the positions, I think it is of Jupiter, moving across the ecliptic. So first of all, it's going from right to left, from it moves from west to east around the ecliptic. And those dots you see on those, uh, on those orbits um, are something like perhaps every 10 days of sidereal time. And they were the great mystery for 2000 years. And Copernicus had this insight that if you assume that the earth itself is moving on a circle uh, and is actually inside Jupiter and is moving faster than Jupiter, uh, you would see these relative motions uh, of Jupiter on the sky and you would get a perfect explanation of it. And that was what persuaded Galileo instantly that Copernicus must be right. Um, and next slide, please. And he has this wonderful saying, he, he, he said of the early astronomers that they could not deduce the structure of the universe and the true symmetry of its parts. On the contrary, their experience was just like someone taking various from various places, hands, feet, a head, and other pieces, very well depicted it may be, but not for the representation of a single person. Since these fragments would not belong to one another, a monster rather than a man would be put together from them. So to get some idea of the difference between what Ptolemy and Copernicus could say, Ptolemy could tell you because he was treating each planet separately, that's like treating uh, one planet like a hand and one like a foot and so forth. He could tell you what the sky would look like from Alexandria 300 years after his death, but he had no idea what the sky looked like from Mars. However, Copernicus did. He could say what the sky looked like from Mars, not only in his own day, but centuries ahead. And it was another 500 years or so before they actually sent spacecraft to Mars and technically confirmed what Copernicus knew. Now, about him not realizing how important the sun was, he, there's this wonderful statement in his De Revolutionibus. At rest, however, in the middle of everything is the sun, for in this most beautiful temple, who would place this lamp in another or better position than that from which it can light up the whole thing at the same time. This indeed, as though seated on a royal throne, thus indeed, as though seated on a royal throne, the sun governs the family of planets revolving around it. 
But in fact, Copernicus never did more than put the sun there as a lantern to illuminate the dance of the planets. And Kepler has this wonderful statement that Copernicus diviatarum suarum ipse inaris. He was unaware of his own riches. Next slide, please. So Kepler was the person who introduced forces into the, into the heavens. Aristotle had introduced forces, not as we understand them today, in terrestrial motions, but not into the heavens. And Kepler was hugely impressed by Tycho Brahe's observation of the comet in 1577. And Kepler interpreted it as, as saying, it must have gone through the, the celestial spheres that hitherto had been assumed to carry the planets around in their orbits. And he thought this had an immense significance. He keeps on re returning to this point in the Astronomia Nova, there are no celestial spheres. And he has this, for me, absolutely wonderful statement. Henceforth, the planets must find their way through the void, like the birds through the air. We must philosophize about these things differently. And if ever you get a chance, do read the Astronomia Nova. There is a translation now into English. The, I read a German one, which describes how he found the ellipses and also the area law. Now, still the only clock with long-term accuracy that could be used to discover the laws of planetary motion was the one, the rotation of the Earth. There was no other clock had that stability. It's the Earth's rotation has only lost a few hours since antiquity. It is such an accurate clock. Now what Kepler found, so first of all, he, he thought that the, he predicted that the sun must rotate because he thought there were rays coming out from the sun that moved Mars round in its orbit. And he thought that Mars, so these were sort of forces that he introduced. He also had magnets which were going to pull Mars towards and push it away from the sun, which would explain Mars's motion. And then Mars would look, so to speak, to the sun and to the stars to see its way forward. So this is how uh, th this wonderful statement about, henceforth the planets must find their way through the void like the birds through the air. We must philosophize about these things differently. Now, what he then found was his famous second law, which was that if you take a line from the sun at the center of its elliptical motion, which Kepler discovered, and you take that radius vector from the sun to the planet, as the planet goes around in its orbit, it sweeps out equal areas in equal time, the time told by the rotation of the Earth. So now that means that you have two clocks that march in step. And this is the critical definition of what is a good clock. You cannot say that one single clock by itself is a good clock because you might find other clocks which run at a different rate relative to it. What you need is not just one clock, but at least two which keep the same time. They might run faster, but the, rate, the ratio of their rates must stay constant. So that's the key thing. So Kepler actually increased the number of uh, clocks that march, the, the, the number of good clocks from one, the Earth, uh, to first of all, the Earth and Mars, but then the other naked eye planets. Uh, so it, it was then up to sort of six or seven. And then relatively soon after that, about 50, 60 years after Kepler had made his great discovery, Flamsteed, uh, the first astronomer royal at the Greenwich Royal Observatory, showed that pendulum clocks also march in step. Pendulum clocks are very accurate. They march in step with each other as they go backwards and forwards. And also they, um, they kept good time relative to uh, the rotation of the Earth 
and the planets as they move around in their orbits. Now, Newton knew all of this. And in fact, there's an incredibly beautiful, one of Newton's proofs, the dynamical explanation of planetary motions. He uses Galileo's law of free fall to determine from the acceleration towards the sun to determine the strength of, of the gravitational force. But he also uses the area that the planet sweeps out as it goes round its elliptical orbit as time. So he's actually using Kepler's second law uh, to tell what the time is. And he's got that all in one diagram in the Principia. It's an incredibly beautiful thing. And Newton, I don't know, he seems to have thought that his absolute space, he called it God's uh, sensorium sort of through which God sees everything in the universe and I think Newton was sort of overcome by the divine implications of his discoveries uh, but really all he need, and he's, he's really rather explicit about this he says the astronomers correct uh, the motion of the sun by what's called, he calls it the astronomical equation, but the astronomers call it the equation of time to make it march in step with the earth. Uh, and, and, and he knows about the area law and about the pendula. pendula. He, he, he mentions Flamsteed's work. So he could just have said, well, there are lots and lots of motions in the universe, which are all, marching in step with each other and that's just the the basic fact and this has now just become incredibly true there are so many clocks now that march in step i couldn't be talking to you now if there weren't umpteen clocks actually coordinating the messages that are going through fiber optic channels and goodness knows what to talk to you uh, it's just unbelievable the interconnection of the universe and how things all march in step in this in this wonderful way. Uh, and I would say that that is the, the the reality of of time. That's what duration is. And so it's all how things move and the correlations between the movements of all the things in the universe that can move because they're all so interlocked in this extraordinary way. It is absolutely amazing uh, how interlocked it all is, um, that you get the impression that there is something fundamental which is called time. So um, I'm not quite sure <laughs> we're talking about time. When did I start? I think I've been going for about 20 minutes. Should I perhaps uh, come to an, I mean, there's quite a bit more I could say, but I think this might be an appropriate point to stop because I think I've made the main point, which is time does not pre-exist. Time is derived from change. And when you've established all the way it does happen, you just cannot, stop being amazed at the intricate interconnection of the whole universe.